I think let's get started. Sorry, I know we're all having fun chatting, but we know Liars Club can take a little bit of time and we're mindful that everybody has very busy lives. So uh, we are going to go ahead and get things started. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put everybody on mute. So please, once you are on mute, unless you are one of our distinguished panel, keep yourself on mute. Uh, Zoom tends to get a really bad echo going if everybody keeps themselves off mute and we don't want that to happen. So uh, we are going to uh, be monitoring the chat section in case you do have questions or technical difficulties. So for those of you who are Zoom newbies, if you take your uh, cursor and float it along the bottom of your screen, you should see a bunch of icons that come up. Uh, the chat function is the one that looks like a little thought bubble. So you can just click into that and then you can see all the comments, make your own comments, questions, technical difficulties, just let us know and we will uh, be on hand to solve those as they come up. Um, also, if you're new to Zoom and you wanna change the way that things appear on your screen, if you take your cursor back up into the upper right hand corner, you can change your, your uh, gallery view, speaker view. Those are basically the two options that I have. So those are probably the two options that you have as well. You can play around with it. You're not gonna hurt anything. Go ahead and scroll through, do whatever you like. Typically the person who is speaking will appear on your screen as the main tile if you have it in speaker view. So that's kind of fun. Gallery view is also fun. So just play around with it. It's, it's, it's all whatever you prefer. Uh, okay, so that was all of my boring blah blah. So let's get started for the very first virtual edition of Liars Club. We're going to be trying out the polling feature of Zoom today. So it will be interactive. You will be able to select who you think is telling the truth after each of the questions has been asked. So be ready for that because we're going to time it. So make sure you have your selection ready to go by the time that little box pops up. It's super duper easy. All you have to do is click on it and uh, select your person and we'll, it'll just show who selected what. And then of course we'll reveal who had the right answer at the end. All right, so we have a very distinguished panel of liars and truth tellers today with our one and only Jim Wilson acting as the moderator. Jim is joining us from, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Cobe. County Cork, where it is quite late. So um, thank you, Jim, for staying up and joining us tonight. Uh, for those of you who haven't traveled with Jim, he wears a lot of hats. We mainly know him as an ornithologist and ecologist, but he's also a wildlife author, a freelance field leader, a broadcaster, and this is really interesting. He also co-produced a phone app called Antarctic Wildlife Guide, which is the first photo ID guide app to the wildlife of the Antarctic region, which is truly impressive to those of us who can barely even download an app onto our phones. So awesome, Jim. Uh, and then I think today we can add to his very long resume game show host. So... <laughs> <laughs> I know that he is going to do a fantastic job guiding us through the very first Liars Club. So I hope we all have a really fun time. And I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Jim so that he can uh, introduce our distinguished panel of liars and truth tellers. So take it away, Jim. Well, Sonia, thank you very much indeed for that intro. Um, yeah, first time doing a virtual Liars Club. Uh, Welcome to all of you out there in Zegram Zoom land. I hope you're all comfortable, settled. I hope you have a pen and paper or something to take down a few notes because just in case you're not sure, um, Liars Club basically is we have a panel of uh, distinguished guests and um, they will be giving you a definition of a word. Uh, each one of them will give a definition, but only one of them is correct. And it's a very simple game. All you gotta do is try and decide which of the four is telling the truth. Nothing more, nothing less than that. That's basically it. Uh, you will then get an option at the end of the, the definitions for the first word 
and then you will be able to poll and put in uh, who you think uh, is the person who is telling the truth. I will be able to see how the polling is going uh, through the wonders of Zagram technology and uh, I will give you an idea of who's voting for who just as things are going. Always remember, you know, just because everybody's voting for somebody doesn't mean they're right, especially in Liars Club, okay? Um, and without further ado, I think I will introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, we've searched all three corners of the known Zegram world to come up with these people. Uh, we've even checked the, uh, the Great Book of Liars. There's, there's a massive book of liars and there was gold stars next to these four people's names. So we knew we had quality liars or as some of them like to prefer to be called uh, untruth tellers. I'm not sure what the difference is, but we, I'm sure we'll find out. So first up on our uh, distinguished panel, our extinguished panel, maybe after tonight, I'm not sure, is uh, Madalena Patashu. And Madalena, or Mada, uh, as we sometimes call her, is from sunny Portugal. Uh, she's got a degree in uh, nature resource management. And once she got that, she went off to a little island off West Africa called Principe, where she helped the people there implement uh, a responsible tourism project. When she's not traveling around the world with Zegram, uh, she's at home in Portugal where she's a naturalist at the aquarium, the O Scenario de Lisboa, where she tells people all about the ocean and how we should look after it. She is an amazing cook. I've tested her cookies on board ship. Unbelievable. And if you want to know how to cook with olive oil, Mada is the one to watch and we've got her on the Zegram channel so check her out there. Mada would you like to say hello to the uh, the guests watching? Hi everyone, hello from Portugal, sunny day although it's already night here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I can assure you can believe in every single thing I'm going to tell you because we Portuguese we never ever lie. The last time we lied was in the Tordesillas Treaty when we said that Canada belonged to the area of Portugal. But that was more than 500 years ago, so you can be sure that I will not tell a single lie tonight. Thank you very much, Mada. Looking forward to all your lovely lies. <laughs> Tom Heine is next up. Tom, originally from just across the pond from where I am here in Ireland. Tom's from the UK, but uh, he moved uh, to the Southern Hemisphere. He's now based in Australia. Tom is an ornithologist, a marine biologist, amongst other things. And uh, for a while, he actually managed a nature reserve on the Seychelles Islands, uh, where he helped in the restoration of coral reefs and things like that. But very interestingly, when I was doing a bit of research on Tom, I read the Zegram bio on him on the website and of course they're always true always true and a little known fact apparently about the Seychelles uh, land tortoises is they must be incredibly fast or Tom must be incredibly slow because according to his bio on the website he spent time chasing giant land turtles to measure their growth rates so I'm looking forward to Tom expanding on that later in, in, the, uh, in the night. But uh, Tom Heine, Tom, would you like to say hello to the guests, please? Good morning, everybody. Absolute pleasure to be here. Jim, you are uh, correct. And of course, many of our Zagram guests will have traveled to the Seychelles and seen the speedy uh, Aldabra giant tortoises that can reach up to 15 miles an hour. Um, now, I'm in a tricky category because I was born in England, which means I'm incredibly truthful but I live in Australia, which means I'm compelled to lie all the time. So it's a great game for me, really, just to pick and choose between truth and lies. Excellent, Tom. Great stuff. And uh, next up, moving swiftly along, uh, we could call this lady uh, your neighbour, Tom, actually. It's uh, Shirley Campbell. She's also on that big island or small continent. I, I'm not a geologist. I don't, know, I don't know what it is. Australia. Lovely place down south. Shirley Campbell, a lot of you would be familiar with Shirley. Her interests are in social anthropology, especially the areas of Australia, Melanesia, and the Pacific. She's fluent in Italian and Vakutan language. Hopefully she might uh, impress us all with some of her Vakutan tonight. Uh, she's spent time sailing, ocean going out riggers, and living with the local people on little islands in the Papua New Guinea. 
and she even wrote a book about it. So go out and buy The Art of Kula if you want it. And one thing she's told me is that she's going to draw on all her skills as a master yoga teacher. She's a master yoga teacher. She's going to use all those skills to keep serene while she lies through her teeth tonight. Shirley, would you like to say hello to everybody? Good morning, everyone. And what an honor it is to be a truth smith amongst all these liars. <laughs> For this inaugural virtual Liars Club, can you believe it? As together, we're going to chart new voyages through Zoom land. Hang on to your seats, my friends, because you have gonna, you're going to hear lots of spinning from my colleagues. They are not the truth. But they're going to spin fantastical tales in these unchartered seas. So let's have a little play with our truth. Me, I'll be telling the truth, but the rest guaranteed liars. <laughs> Well, Shirley, that, that's, that's a good, good start. And it'll, uh, I think you've raised the bar there really for everybody else. That it's going to be hard to, to better that. But last, by, by no means least, definitely by no means least, may I introduce to you who needs to introduce this man, I say sometimes, Mr. Jack Grove. Jack is the fourth member of the panel of Liars Club tonight, or as he prefers to be called, uh, an untruth teller. Uh, he's obviously a follower. I think of, was it George Washington was the guy in America that said he never told the lie? Was that Thomas Jefferson? Anyway, one of them. Uh, they all look the same from this distance here in Ireland. But uh, anyway, Jack, uh, a marine biologist, an author, an ichthyologist, uh, co-founder of Zagram Expeditions. He is not just the G in Zagram. He's the G-R that gives it the grr, that kind of edge. Har, grr, you often hear Jack go like that. He's written a book on the fishes of the Galapagos and he is working feverishly on the second edition at the moment. We look forward to that when it comes out. And uh, one little thing about Jack, I, 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 I was doing a bit of research uh, uh, on, on the archives in Zagram and I, I discovered that apparently Jack, he learned to, to, to love the fish and marine life when as a kid he was learning to swim because he met a, a a guy in a dark trench coat with a violin case under his arm one day uh, when he was playing truant from school. And the guy said to me, he says, you know, uh, you might end up sleeping with the fishes someday. And it was after that, that Jack learned to swim and that's where he discovered the fish and that's where he's been most of his life. Jack Grove, the one and only. Jack, would you like to say hello to everybody? Jim, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, what a... Uh... A wonderful opportunity uh, as I look down the list of participants and if the new newbies here in Zoom land haven't figured it out, you can look in the upper right and click on the button and you can see who is online. Well, I've sent an invitation to friends on Pitcairn Island and on Easter Island and so there might be some people tuning in who don't know that Zagram is indeed the world's leading adventure travel company. I, before I say any more, it's uh, wonderful to be on this panel with my esteemed colleagues. Um, and I don't wish to denounce them, but I know all three of them to be sometimes untruthful. <laughs> uh, I also have noticed that Madalena has a hat that she thought <laughs> The biggest. So um, let the competition begin and let everyone in our cyber audience know that Jack Steingrove only speaks the truth. Fantastic, Jack. That is just brilliant. Well, listen, folks, now that you've got to, to know a little bit about our panelists, and welcome to any of those of you who've joined late. In case you think you've pressed on the wrong Zoom meeting, this is the Zagram uh, Armchair Adventurers uh, Expedition Extravan Extravaganza Liars Club Night. Uh, if this is not where you were meant to be, I wouldn't change your channel because you will <laughs> not be sorry. This is going to be one hell of a bit of entertainment uh, tonight, coming from all over the world, all over the world, truly international. 
And uh, so what we're going to do is, I think we're going to head straight into it. So get your pens and paper ready. Focus and, and watch every move. If you're a poker player, it might be a help because watch their eyes. You know, you might be able to get a few clues as to whether they're really good at telling lies and are, are on truths or not, okay? So we'll head straight into it. So you'll, we'll give you the word. They'll each give a definition. Only one of them is correct. And at the end of the four definitions, we will then open the poll and you will vote. And then we'll move on to question two and so on and so forth down the line and see how many of them you get right during the night. It's really just a bit of fun, a nice bit of entertainment, uh, nothing too heavy. Uh, I do hear that some people have big bets on tonight, but of course, Zagram would, would not condone uh, anything like that. Uh, we're, we're, we're not that type of a, a company. But, um, but I, I hope I win, okay? Uh, all right, first up, the first word of 10. If we hope we get through it by dawn, maybe. I think that'll be lunchtime in Australia or, or, or probably tea time in uh, the West Coast of America. The very first word, and without any expense spared, we've got the highest technology to bring you the actual, the actual words we're going to talk about. The first one, can you see that? It looks backwards to me, but I hope it doesn't to you. The first word is lurestes. Lurestes. This is the first word we're going to ask the panel to talk about. Okay, Lurestes. That's the word. And I'm going to ask Mada to get the ball rolling, to kick off and tell us what she thinks Lurestes means. Mada. Thank you, Jim. Um, so Lorestus was the first man to calculate the circumference of Earth in 240 BC. He achieved surprisingly good results by combining geometrical calculations with physical observations using two Egyptian cities. Incredibly, his value was only 1.4% less than the real value of the circumference of the Earth. But the most well-known person to do this was Ptolemy. He did it in the second century and he was wrong by 30% lower of the right number. Ptolemy included this value in his Treaty of Geography. This has become a very relevant point in history because during the discovery times they used this value to calculate their expeditions. And so this meant that Magellan spent three extra months at sea without food and water in what we call today our biggest ocean in our planet, the Pacific Ocean. And also it's one of the arguments that Columbus would not accept the fact that he did not reach India because according to his calculations, he must have been there. So Lorestes was lost in history but he was actually the first man to calculate the circumference of Earth, 240 BC, and he was almost right. Well, you're setting that bar very high, Mada. That sounded very convincing to me. Uh, all right, Tom, see, can you do any better? Uh, we'd like to call in Tom from Australia. Tom Heine, can you give us your definition for lurestes? Lurestes. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jim. And, and talking of almost being right, Mada is almost right, but almost completely wrong as well. Um, which, which shows such a good fib to start with. Lorestes was um, a forgotten man and was, was in BC, but the dates were around 100 BC to 44 BC in that era of Caesar. And Lorestes is actually um, the forgotten man of amphibian or herpetological research. And any of you uh, after this who wish to verify my facts should simply Google, not now, no Googling now, later on, the Italian tree frog which uh, is Hyla Lorestes, uh, named after him. Um, of course, he didn't get to name it. Um, old Linnaeus, when he finally got round to naming it, uh, honoured him in his memory. But um, unfortunately, everyone else forgot the poor chap, the, uh, the forgotten man of herpetology in Italy, Lorestes. Well, Tom, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Equally convincing, equally convincing. Moving swiftly on, uh, I'd like to call in your neighbour from down under there. Shirley, Shirley, could you give us your definition for lurestes? 
Indeed, I can, Jim. And I have to say, my two colleagues, my two dear friends, are the biggest liars I have ever heard. That's just absolutely ridiculous. Because you might know Lorestes by its much more pedestrian name. It's a Grunion. Now, I know that that sounds like something horrible that sits on the bottom of your foot, but it's not. It's a fish. And there are two species of Grunion. There's a Californian Grunion and there's the Gulf Grunion. Now this little fish being only 19 centimeters or nine inches or seven inches long is not very important to the fishing industry. They really don't care. But this little fish, when it, thank you, Jim, when it is running and gonna lay its eggs, it runs along the, the southern coast of California and the Gulf of Mexico, and it beaches itself to lay its eggs. And that's probably about the only time that they, people actually to make the effort to go and grab some of them and cook them up for a very bony, small meal. A grunion is what Lorestes is. Shirley, thank you very, very much indeed. That was, that was very, very good indeed. And moving swiftly on, last but by no means least, uh, could we call in Jack? I think it's from the Orange State or the, I don't know, with the Panhandle or one of those places in America. Jack, could you give us your definition, please, for Lorestes? Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to say, as I sit in front of this extensive library of ichthyology and systematic taxonomy in the world of fishes, uh, I am not surprised to hear my esteemed and beloved friend, Shirley Campbell, lying about this name but she made a mistake to apply it to a fish. Okay, so just so everyone knows, I'm putting on my truth-telling hat. And what I'm here to tell you is that Shirley is correct. Now, I wonder how many people are cheating because if they're cheating in this game. I mean, this is a club. So if they're cheating, they already know that Lorestes is indeed a genera, a genus. Genera is plural for genus. So Lorestes is a genus of fish. But I got to tell you a little story. It was, and I, I made a note, in September of 2018, a joint expedition between Scripps Institute of Oceanography and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution were in the Cayman Trench with a deep sea submersible and they collected specimens. And one of them was a sea cucumber that they brought up from the depths of the Cayman Trest, Trench. And they brought that specimen up. They put it on the deck and it ejaculated, squirted out, pooped out, whatever you wish to call it from the anal opening of the sea cucumber, and there it was, the first record of a pearl fish, now believe it or not, belonging to the family Carapidae, C-A-R-A-P-A-D-I-A-E, Carapidae. That's a known family of fish. The, fi the little pearl fish is there on the deck. They preserved it, they examined it, and indeed it was a new species and it belonged to the family Carapidae genus uh, Lorestes. Genus Lorestes, and the species was then named Caymanensis. So Lorestes is a genus of fish, but it's not a grunion for God's sake, Shirley. Stick to anthropology. Woo! Uh, Jack is, is laying down the gauntlet there. We've only just gone through the first set of definitions and he's already having a dig at someone. This is gonna be exciting, that's for sure. Of course, Jack is the fish expert, but it doesn't mean he knows everything. So uh, we, gotta be, we gotta see what happens here. Okay, just as a summary, and by the way, Tom, thanks for reminding everyone, you don't look up anything on the Google machine tonight and you don't use your granny's dictionary either, the analog version, all right? You leave all those away, you, you gotta just, Guess and see how you get on. So just to summarize before we ask you to vote, Mada thought it was the first man to calculate the circumference of the earth in 240 BC. Tom thinks it's a little known Roman frog biologist. 
uh, Shirley thinks it's a genus of fish commonly known as grunions. And ichthyologist extraordinaire, Jack, thinks it's a genus of deep sea pearl fish. So now time to vote. Which one of these do you think is correct for Lurestes? That's the one and the, and now we have it open. The uh, polling is open and I can see how things are going. And Shirley's way out in front. She's got 55% of the polls so far. Uh, Tom is lagging a bit behind. Jack, you're way behind at the moment. You're way, your face is way too honest, I'm afraid, for this gang tonight. Shirley is still in front. Madeleine is catching up. Tom is, is doing well in the background. Jack is still way behind. He's not even past the first post while Madeleine is coming around, doing well. She's gaining speed, but Shirley is still way out in front with 83% of the vote in already in just 40 seconds. This is incredible. Tom, Tom, Tom's after stagnating little. Jack, you're consistent, that's for sure. You're still last. They, you know, I, I don't know what's going on here, but for some reason, they think Shirley has the honest face tonight. And we're, we're coming up to the end. We're giving it another 10 seconds before we close the poll. Come on, folks, any more votes, any more votes, any more votes? Going once, three, two, one. That's it, end of polling. Thank you, folks. Well, according to the poll, the poll of the Liars Club, Shirley was the one most people, and that was actually less than half, Shirley, don't get carried away, thought that you were correct. Uh, and Tom was second, the joint second, Madalena, and Jack was way back on 9%. Okay, well, could the person on the panel who actually told the truth. Could you please make yourself known to everybody now? Does it matter? <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. I told you. I only told the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Shirley, Shirley, well done. Uh, Shirley was actually the one that was telling the truth for that one. So that's question one. Okay, folks, you got the hang of it. I'm sure if you have any problems, as I say, you're able to use the chat, chat line there to get on to Sonia. Make sure you get onto the right chat line, by the way, folks. Uh, nothing dodgy. Uh, you never know what sort of replies you might get this hour of the evening, wherever you live. Moving swiftly on, we're going to go for question two, okay? Uh, and uh, I'll just get that out of the way there. Question two in our Lions Club night, virtually speaking. This is, well, it's word number two. We want to know which of our four panelists is telling the truth with this word, Musashi. Musashi is the word. And we want to know which of our panelists is going to tell the truth. And to get the ball rolling for our Musashi, can I ask Tom, please? Tom, could you come in and give us your definition? Thank you. Absolutely, Jim. It would be my pleasure. And I am, yeah, amazed by some of the tool stories emerging already. This is a, a very clear and easy definition, so I won't take long. As a keen scuba diver, I know many of you dive, you're probably familiar with the shipwreck of the Musashi. Uh, the Musashi was, of course, we all know, everybody knows, a famous Japanese battleship, one of the biggest ever made, um, sunk in 44, uh, built in 1939, and then discovered uh, very late on by Paul Allen, the Microsoft chappie in 2015. So I won't waste any time, start with the truth, a large Japanese warship, Musashi. Excellent, Tom, that's what I like it, short and to the point, no messing about, no BS. Okay, uh, could I ask Shirley please, Shirley, could you, uh, Give us your definition. You certainly can, Jim. And this is a much more, well, sort of a modern one. So Musashi was, is a unique formula that was created by the Japanese to enhance the bulk and strength and power of sumo wrestlers. More recently, it's been reformulated to, to boost as a pre-energy, as an energy drink for pre-workouts. I have some actually with me, and I'll just read what it's got on here. It's got citrulline, beta-alanine, caffeine, creatine, and amino acids. Now, it's been, as I say, it was used in the past, but it's been reformulated so that it, people say, testimonials say that when they drink this, 
it enhances and makes them feel much stronger and they lift much heavier weights. So Musashi is actually a contemporary sports enhancing drink. Excellent, Shirley. Thank you very much indeed. And moving swiftly on, Jack, are you still with us there? Have you got oh, your yeah, hands started? I, I, am, I am a little disappointed uh, because my last truth <laughs> hat didn't work. Uh, so I will try a different hat. And for those guests who have been to South Korea, they will be familiar with the name Musashi because it is a South Korean form of sushi. It is uh, a blend of uh, sea urchin gonads blended with raw fish. Musashi is a sushi dish in South Korea. Thank you very much, Jack. I, that was very convincing with that hat in your head, for sure. That's a better one. I think you're onto a good thing there. Mada, finally, could you uh, give us your definition, please, for Musashi? Yes, Jim. So some of my colleagues were pretty close in the country. Uh, musashi is a Japanese word related to aesthetics. It is a concept derived from Buddhism. This concept considers that what is beautiful is what is imperfect, incomplete, and impermanent, meaning that the things that are not perfect, they are changing all the time, are the ones that are beautiful. It is to find beauty or serenity with age and to accept imperfection. In Lisbon, we actually have an aquarium that has an exhibit uh, produced by Takashi Amano, a designer and photographer from Japan who traveled the world and he got impressed with the destruction of nature. So he started building nature aquariums to raise awareness for conservation. And he uses two concepts that are very import important for his aquariums. It is the Zen rock arrangement and Musashi, to find beauty and serenity in imperfection. That's Musashi. Thank you very much, Mada. Thank you very much, all your panelists. That was really, really good. Now it's make your mind up time. This is the word again, Musashi. So which of our four distinguished or extinguished panelists has been telling us the truth this time? And don't uh, think we follow a formula. It doesn't mean that just because someone got it right the last time that they might get it right this time too, or maybe get them all right. Uh, we mix it up just to mess with your brain. All right, the poll is open. Start your voting, please, for Musashi. There we go, Musashi. Immediately, Madeleine is way out in front. She's doing well. Tom is coming up. Jack is doing much better. He's still last, but he's much better this time. Uh, uh -huh. Madeline, <laughs> Madeline is way out in front. Shirley, oh, Shirley slipped way back. Jack's in third place. Tom's in second. Uh, we're about 75% of the vote is in. Uh, Madeline is out in front with about half the vote. Tom's in second with about a quarter of the vote. Uh, Jack is doing all right there on 17%. Shirley's down on seven. Um, again, Madeline seems to have done a good job. Yeah, yeah, you can do all of that. Panelists, do whatever you can to try and get more votes. That's what it's all about. Uh, Madalena is hanging in there on a solid 50% of the vote, and we're nearly there. I'm going to count down 10, 9, 8, 7, Please. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The poll is closed. Thank you very much, folks. And based on the poll, 49% of you think Madalena was correct. 26 thought Tom was, 19 thought Jack was. You're improving, Jack. Shirley, 7% this time, I'm afraid. Take it easy. The day is long for you. You're only just up your, uh, your grand. All right. So once again, can the panelist who had the truth serum just before they spoke, who had it right, could the correct answer please be given? Who was it that gave the correct definition for Musashi? Let us know. Me! I'm telling the truth. Well done. You fooled three quarters of them. Good on you. That's, that's good going. That is really good. I hope you're all doing well out there, folks. Um, we're having fun anyway. Whatever about you. And the main thing is that we're having fun. So there you go. So make what you can out of it. Uh, my technology seems to be working so far. 
I haven't run out of batteries yet. So now, next up, and we'll move swiftly on because I'm, I'm conscious of the time as well, and we'd like to get as many of these as we can done, uh, as I say, before dawn. Uh, next word up, number three on the list, uh, uh, is this word here. Kuthi. Kuthi. This is the third of our list. The word is Kuthi. That's the one we're asking you to see which of our panelists is going to tell the truth this time in the definition. So I'd like to call in, who did I call the last time? I'd like to call in Jack. Jack, could you give us your definition, please? Yes, and uh, since nobody seems to be believing me enough, I'm going to try a different hat. So um, I just became familiar with the word kuthi myself because uh, they are about to release a half a million genetically modified mosquitoes in Monroe County, in my backyard. You can't make this shit up. It's for real. The mosquitoes are about to be released if the county commissioners approve of it. Well, the term kuthi, which I submitted for this club that we're doing because I have knew none of you would have heard of it, and I bet there's nobody in the audience here who has heard of the word kuthi, the technical uh, origin, uh, and, but they know the word Zika, Zika virus. Well, in, um, I don't know how you say it in Portuguese, but it is a Portuguese term, kuthi, and it applies to the Zika virus. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, next up, could I have Mada? Mada, can you give us your definition, please, for kuthi? Kuthi. Thank you. Sorry, Jack, but this is more kind of a French thing. Kauti refers to the syndrome of Kauti from Louis Kauti. He was born in 1854 and he was a French physician and physiologist. He identified what is today better known as foreign accent syndrome, which is a medical condition where patients develop speech patterns that are perceived to be a foreign accent that is very different from their native one. This can result from a stroke or a very severe head trauma. And so Cauti is actually referred to the syndrome of Cauti from a French physician, Louis Cauti from 1854. Thank you very much, Mada. Thank you very, very much indeed. And could we have Tom, please? Tom, could we get your definition, please? Absolutely, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me up. This is a word, Jim, I'd expect you to be very familiar and uh, anyone else who has spent time in the British Isles. Um, kuthi, obviously, you're probably familiar with the word uncouth, like my colleagues who are telling terrible lies. We could describe them as uncouth. And kuthi is the opposite. It's like a warm, agreeable, genial feeling. Um, you find similar words throughout the British uh, Isles. The word cotch, for example, C-W-T-C-H in Welsh. It's just that kind of warm, fuzzy, um, comfortable feeling. Uh, but kuthi is the Scottish version for, for that kind of happy, fuzzy goodness. Kuthi. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, from, from the Irish and British Isles, I, I, I'll agree, you know, yes, that, that's quite a possibility. Um, Shirley, finally, can you give us your definition for kuthi? I certainly can. And I have to say that my friend Jack is way out on the left. I have no idea where what he's been drinking today. But you know, Mada is not, she's kind of got the word right. It's got a French connection. And my dear friend Tom, he sort of has the idea because it does have, it's definitely got a British connection. I don't know about Scotland, but definitely British. In that, Kuthi is an old English word that is used to to describe the person who was the designer for court, court, um, court uh, dresses and designs. So it, a kuthi is the man who designs the court design dress. And you might think that the word couture, which is a French word, comes from that word or the other way around. I, my bet is that the word couture comes from kuthi, which is an old English word. Mm. Thank you very much indeed, Charlie. Thank you very much indeed. So, 
what we've got for this word is, we think, Jack thinks it's a slang word for a virus spread by mosquitoes. Mada, a French physician and physiologist, uh, after which a couple of syndromes were called. Uh, Tom thinks it's a Scottish word, meaning someone who's agreeable or genial. And Shirley thinks it's an old English word for the designer of court fashion. Once again, folks, it's up to you to decide who you think is telling the truth. The polls are open now. Uh, vote early and often. Oh, very even Stevens this time. Uh, Tom, Tom's out in front, Madalena. It's, this is very even, folks. I think the panel have you fooled on this one. You're guessing, you're, you're really wild. This is, it's swinging all over the place. Madalena now is doing well. Tom is out in front, Shirley is doing well. Jack, you're holding your own there, although you're still last, but at least you're consistent, you know. You'll win the prize for consistency, that's for sure. Madalena, you're doing okay. Uh, let me see, Tom's doing well. You're voting a lot quicker, folks, this time around as well. You're getting the hang of it. Come on, we, there's a few of you out there still. Uh, you know, it doesn't cost you to vote. We're not going to charge you for voting if you're worried about, you know, being billed at the end of this for all the voting. It's free, so please click on your, your options on your buttons and see, and see who you go. Oh, there's one more after voting. I'm going to count it down. Uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The poll is now closed. And all of you out there in Zagram Zoom, Zoom land, you reckon Tom was telling the truth this time with 40% and Madalena was on a close second with 31. So, uh, Liars Club panel, can whichever of you told the truth, could you please gesticulate or do something to indicate which one of you told the truth this time around. Who have we got? It was me. Oh, yeah. It was me, Jim. Nice I started one. with a lie, but it's all truth from hearing people. That's two in a row. <laughs> Trust your friend, Tom. Here we go. Truths only from now. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. That was good. That was very, very good. Um, uh, they're on the ball tonight, as we would say here in Ireland. The, 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 the gang out there uh, watching in are on the ball tonight. They were... They sniffed out a, a liar when they saw one. So we're moving swiftly on to number four. And this one is a lovely little name. And it's called Pooter. Pooter. I think that's how it's pronounced. I may be pronouncing these all wrong, by the way. But our panel on the Liars Club will put me straight if I am definitely pronouncing it wrong. Pooter is this word. And to get the ball rolling on this round, could I ask Mada to come in first, please? Mada, could you give us your definition for pooter? Thank you very much indeed. Yes, Jim. So pooter is actually an object. Imagine you want to collect some small insect bugs and things like that without harming them. I don't know why. You can pick it up a bottle with a tight lid on it, and then you put two holes in it, and you put two tubes, like straws. It is important to put a mesh on one of those. This is a way that you can do your small portable bug aspirator. Then all you have to do is apply suction to the right straw because if you do the wrong one, you're gonna end up eating the bugs actually. And be careful to put the mesh properly. So then you put the mesh, you apply suction, and then you get all the bugs inside it. It's super helpful, super useful. It's something you should do on your quarantine because you know we don't have better things to do right now. And you can only imagine people like Humboldt, Darwin, or even Attenborough collecting their own pooter around. Oh, there's an interesting bug, I wanna study. So you just, and then you have it. So pooter is a bottle one uses suction to collect insects. Very intriguing, Mada. Thank you very much indeed. That sounded very convincing. Tom, can you give us your definition, please, for pooter? Your definition for pooter, thank you. Uh Absolutely, Jim. It is. It is an absolute hoot listening to some of the lies my my dear colleagues are concocting. It's uh, their creativity clearly knows no bounds. Um, anyone who has studied terrestrial biology, as I did, um, will be familiar with the the term pooter. It's a, it's a bit of a slang term 
Um, and it's a combination, uh, unsurprisingly, of poo. I'm sorry, if any of you have a sensitive disposition, you should look away now. Poo and deter. And it's, it's a slang term used in terrestrial biology for um, basically how often male animals mark out their territory. And many of you will have seen um, males of certain species, usually large predators, who go around their territory and leave collections of droppings and dung out to sort of mark out where they are, act as a bit of a scent trail. I'm sure probably Chris Stamper would agree with me if he were here. Um, so Puta is simply that, a bit of a slang, just how um, males of species are, are marking out their territories to deter others. Wow. Now, that wow, indeed, Jim. That sounds good too, Tom. That sounds really good. I truly truth only. Can, can you do better than that, Shirley, please? Uh, absolutely. I can tell you the truth, which is basically a pooter is a machine that makes the, of the sound of a flatulence. In a nutshell, it's a fart machine. It's something that you hold in your hand. It's a small rubber thing that holds in your hand. It's got a little tiny hole in one end. And when you squeeze it into the palm of your hand, it makes the most authentic fart sound in all of mankind. It is only made of rubber. There's no batteries that are attached to it. So it's environmentally sound. It only has rubber. It's one of those things that young kids like to use as a prank. And some adults, I have to say, like to use it as a prank, go around squeezing it and they make a little fart sound, a pooter. Fantastic. Uh, I'm glad we're after the nine o'clock uh, wa watershed for, uh, for that definition. You know, it, this is a family program, but you know, it's late enough. So hopefully all the young ones are in bed. Yes, and finally, Jack, you're gonna give us the truth on this one. Can you give us your definition, Jack? Thank you very much indeed. So many of our guests have, uh, oh, by the way, I'm gonna try a different hat. I'm going to wear my Snooky hat because um, my other ones didn't seem to be working. But uh, uh, so many of our guests uh, that are listening this evening have traveled in India. And if they spent any time with the um, residents, especially in Mumbai, uh, they would be familiar with that term, Puter. It is the uh, word used in uh, slums uh, for a uh, public toilet in India. And by the way, it was first published in English uh, in a, a novel called Shantaram, which is very readable, good, good novel. Shantaram used Puter for the first time it, that it was published that I know. And that's um, a public uh, outhouse in the slums of Mumbai. Jack, thank you very much for that. Uh, that, sound, that sounds good too. They all sound good. That's the problem. These people are really on fire tonight. We've got, we've got a great Liars Club in. Really, really good. Well, folks, you know, the, you know the, the, the drill by now. What we want you to do is decide which one of our Liars on the panel gave the correct definition. And the polls are open. You can start your voting now. And you're, boy, you're well into it. Jack, you're in front. Oh my God, you're way out in front at the moment. Well done, Jack. Keep that cap on. Keep that cap on. The others are just nowhere to be seen. Tom, Tom, I think you can go for your uh, coffee break. Uh, I know you've you've only got uh, engaged. I hear in the last day or two to to your fiance. Now you're you're now fiance, Sasha. So if you really need to go for a couple of seconds, you're more than welcome. All right. And of course, after this, you will not be really eligible for Liars Club anymore because you're going to have to be an honest boy now that you're engaged. Congratulations on behalf of everyone I'm sure that's here. I am not pulling your leg, folks. Uh, Tom only just got engaged to his lovely lady, uh, Sasha, recently. Well done. And on that, uh, we've nearly got everybody in again. A couple of late ones undecided about who is right on this one. Pooter, five, four, three, two, one. We're closing the poll on that now. Jack! Jack, 60% of the vote. They actually think, I, I hope it wasn't um, a kind of a sympathy vote this time, folks. I mean, there's no room for sympathy in this game. Jack wouldn't give you sympathy. You shouldn't give him any either. But I'm sure he appreciates coming first in the poll. But, but who actually told the truth? Once again, panel, can the Real truth teller, please reveal themselves.
죽어서 It's me. It's Madalena. Well done, Madam. Congratulations. You yeah. You fool them. tell the truth occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, folks, now you know. Don't be fooled by that lovely, smiling Portuguese face. Because I think over 80% of you thought she was not telling the truth. There you go. All right, we'll move swiftly on. This one I've been practicing all day. How to pronounce it because I don't really speak English as you've probably managed to ascertain already tonight. I, I speak a kind of a funny version of it. This one, this is the next one, number five. <laughs> I'm gonna get it wrong. <laughs> I shouldn't, have, I should have just said it. Asipenserin. Asipenserin. This is the, this is what it's called. This is what I'm getting a thumbs up from Tom, so at least we're both. Speaking roughly the same language. This is the word we want you to listen to carefully, listen to the, the definitions being given, and decide who is telling the truth. And we'll start with you, Tom, the engaged man from down under. Thank you, Jim. Always good to start with the truth, I think. Um, Asi Penserin, perhaps some of our guests may know uh, the product, the antibiotic, or may even take it. I, I don't know. What, what word you use, it might have a different brand name in the States, but acipenserin um, is an antibiotic that is commonly uh, prescribed, certainly in the English speaking world, you know, England, for example, Australia, New Zealand, those sorts of places. Um, uh, antibiotic commonly prescribed to treat stomach infections that are caused by excessive acid reflux. So uh, my poor grandfather used to take acipenserin um, for quite a long time struggled a lot with, with acid reflux, and acipenserin is the antibiotic used to treat infections caused by it. Very good, Thomas. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Said you. like an honest man. Well done. Next up, Shirley. Shirley, can you give us your definition, please? Yeah, I certainly can. My goodness, Tom, that's very, very good, very close, but not quite there. As you all, all, many of you know that I'm a sourdough maker, right? Acipenserin is part of that culture. Now, I, a lot of you may not know that there are 25 different yeast microbes in a sourdough culture. There are also 40, um, um, what are they called? Bacterial microbes in a sourdough culture. One of the bacterial microbes is acipenserin. And acipenserin is an antibiotic microbe. And it is very useful in a sourdough culture because sourdough cultures do not go moldy. It, an acipenserin, it uses its antibiotic ability to keep the culture, any of the invasive microbes that would make the culture go bad, keeps them out. And also if you eat sourdough bread, you'll notice that it does not go moldy, unlike other kinds of bread. Acipenserin is one of the bacterial microbes in sourdough culture. Wow. Shirley, I don't know, are you a sour dough maker or a sour dough maker? But we'll, 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 we'll leave that role for now. Um, Jack, please, can, can you give us your definition? Thank you very much. Well, since this is um, an ichthyological term, once again, I'm sure people will recognize that I speak the truth. I know about <laughs> ichthyology and I also know about a family of fish, just a a brief review of uh, taxonomy. If a word ends in I-D-A-E, it is a family. The family Asipenserinidae as 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 is the family in which the sturgeons, the freshwater sturgeons uh, live um, or belong. And, uh, and Asipenserin, is a toxic substance derived from the gonads of uh, sturgeons. That's it? Excellent. Thank you, Jack. To the point. And finally, calling Portugal, calling Portugal. Mara, could you come in, please, and give us your definition? Yes. So it's not acipenserin, it has a little bit of a different twist. The origin of this word goes back to the old Gauls. Gauls was a heartland of the Dreads, 
who were the first in Gaul to develop an original philosophy. Dritz studied astronomy, geography, natural science, and religion, and also believed that the soul did not die. Immortality of the soul and reincarnation were very important to them. And this line of thinking was assis pense Assis pense, pense is from thinking, assis je pense, a way of believing and thinking. Hence, assis pense Unfortunately, after the Roman conquest, the Dridism disappeared entirely, at least as a philosophical school. So, assis pense was a Gaul's philosophy line of thinking. Thank you, Mada. So, to... Uh... Just to do a quickly recap, I, I skipped it in the last one because I'm, I'm conscious of the time as well at the moment, folks. So, Asi Penserin uh, was, Tom suggested an antibiotic prescribed for stomach infection. Shirley said it's an antibiotic microbe in a sour dough culture. Uh, Jack thought it was a toxic substance reputedly obtained from the gonads of a sturgeon. There's a lot of gonads going on tonight for some reason in these definitions. And, and Mada finally said it's a Gaulish word uh, derived from the, the, to think uh, to, as in pensive. So which of our Liars Club panel is telling the truth for this word here? Asipenserin. The poll is open. It's actually open 10 seconds already, folks. Get Voting now. Shirley's way out in front at 56%. Tom is in second place with 90%. Madeleine is last at 13%. Jack's on 16%. Uh, Shirley is still well out in front at 51% with 81% of the vote in at the moment. Tom is on 20%. He's catching up a little bit. Jack is getting a few more sympathy votes there. Uh, Madalena, sorry, Madalena, they just don't like your, your they, they really are not going for you on this one. Uh, after the last one, Shirley on 51. Uh, we've got 85% of the vote in. I'm going to do a countdown. 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and a 1. The poll is closed. Thank you, folks, uh, for voting early and often. Shirley is out in front uh, on the uh, viewers poll for uh, the definition of asipenserin. Well, as before folks, could the real truth teller for asipenserin please let us know. Yeah, you can believe it folks, it's Jack, the one and only Jack Grove. Jack was correct. He fooled over 80% of you on that one. Well done, Jack. You did a great job. I think you're, you're coming into your own. I think you're warming up well. It's a this is very, to the it. <laughs> very foreign to me. So I'm catching on little by little. <laughs> okay, folks, we're going to do two more and we'll wrap it up because it's getting early for some of you and getting late for others. And, I, and anybody who's sandwiched in between, lucky you. I hope you're all enjoying your morning, afternoon, evening, night, wherever you are. Uh, we're having great fun. This is working out well. I hope it's working out well for all of you watching as well at home. Right, moving swiftly on. Less of a guff, Jim, as my mother used to say. And we're going for this one. This is number six. Zooanthropy. Zooanthropy. This is the word, zooanthropy. And yet again, one of the panel will be right and the rest of them will not be right. So Shirley, can you get the ball rolling with your definition, please? Thank you. I certainly can. Thank you, Jim. Zooanthropy is, well, you probably, probably will know it better as the werewolf syndrome. So zooanthropy is a clinical form of lycanthropy. And lycanthropy or zoanthropy, what that means is that somebody thinks they have a delusion that they are an, uh, an animal, that they have trying change in an animal. Now we all know about the werewolf syndrome and we all know the shapeshifters. Zoanthropy is the condition of changing shape into an animal and back again. Thank you very much, Shirley. Thank you very much indeed. That sounds really good. Uh, next up, uh, fresh from his victory in the last round. Jack, could you give us uh, your definition for zooanthropy, please? Sweet, simple, and honest. Mammals that have facial hair, 
and the analysis of mammals that have facial hair is zoanthropology. That's it. Yep. You're obviously getting paid by the word tonight, Jack, and, and you've, you're, you're running up to your limit. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Mada, moving swiftly on. Mada in Portugal, can you give us your uh, definition, please? <clears throat> yes, I'm going very far away from here. So if you've ever been to the Arctic with us, you, we must have talked about the Inuit Olympics, which is an annual multi-sport event designed to preserve cultural practices and traditional survival skills, essentials to life in circumpolar regions. With games like seal hop, four man carry, ear pull, one foot high kick and seal skinning, since ancient times, native people of polar regions have gathered together for these games to practice their strength, endurance, balance and agility. So zoanthropy, it's actually a trophy, a zoan trophy, and this is a trophy that is much appreciated for the challenge of seal skinning. So it's a kind of a trophy from Inuit Arts of Survival. Obrigado. Thank you very much indeed, Mada. Thank you for that. Next up, please, uh, last but by no means least, Tom, I hope you're back with us. I can't see you, but um, uh, can you give us your definition, please? Absolutely, Jim. Gladly give you um, some truthful definition. I, I fear my colleagues have gone a little over the top here, um, trying to pull the wool over our, uh, our guests' eyes, who are far too well educated to fall for it, which I know sounds like the start to a whopping lie. But if we look at the word zoanthropy, it's clearly comprised of two words, zo and anthropy. Combining, we have zoos, philanthropy, and zoanthropy just refers um, to pretty much no longer used but the art of donating animals to zoos back in the days of early collectors you know 100 to 200 years ago people disappear come back with a lion and then the commoners wanted to see them so very kindly the rich would be zoanthropic and donate their zoo their animals to the zoo in an act of zooanthropy zoo philanthropy zooanthropy Gosh, some well, of the Tom, lies tonight, Jim. Hey? Wow. <laughs> I'm glad we've got one honest boy in, in the audience. You know, there's always one around, and that's Tom. I forgot. Apologies, by the way, for all of you down under. I should have showed you the 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 the, the, the name like this, isn't it? <laughs> 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 I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I'm I'm sorry about that. But here's this one anyway for all of you in the southern hemisphere. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> Less <laughs> frivolity, less of the frivolity. All right, so we've got, it's either a werewolf syndrome. It's, that's what Shirley thinks it is. It's the study of mammals that have facial hair, according to Jack. Mada thinks it's a, it's a trophy uh, for the Inuit Olympics. And Tom thinks it's a process for donating animals to zoos. So this is the word. Get voting now, folks. Uh, the poll is open. Shirley's out in front at the moment. 58%, 60%. Tom's only on 19. Madalena, you can go have a coffee. You're on 6%. Jack's on 15. Shirley's on 61%. Tom's on 18%. Madalena still is on 6%. Jack's in third place on 14%. Shirley's on a static 60%. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah, no, Tom, all of that just, oh, it brought you up three or four percent. You're doing really well. Keep going. Keep the thumbs. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to do a countdown here because things are starting to pan out here. Madalena, definitely. They don't believe you, Madalena. Don't take it personally. Ten seconds. Nine. Ups. Shocked. She. Kuig. Kahar. Tre. Do. Ahen. That's it. In Gaelic. Time up. Shirley is the winner on the poll. They believed you more than anybody else, Shirley. So, yet again, for the penultimate time tonight, that means the second last, by the way, folks, uh, I think. Um, who of our liars was actually not lying? Let us know. Come on. Yes! Yeah. All right, Shirley. Yeah, it was Shirley. Well done, Shirley. You fooled 43% of us. 
Well done. Excellent. Werewolves. Werewolf well, syndrome. The werewolf syndrome. So you're learning all sorts of things tonight. As with all the adventures with Zegram Expeditions, it's educational as well as entertainment. So we always send you away learning something new. It might be something you don't really want to have in your brain, but it's going to be there anyway, okay? You never know when it might come in handy. So for the final round, like all good things, it has to come to an end for now. And I'm sure we're going to do Liars Club again. But this time, you know, it, it won't be in the steady sort of confines of our houses. It'll be more like on the high seas. This will be more like what it's going to be like back and forth. You know, nice, rocking, gentle. Half of you in the lounge falling asleep. The other half wondering, you know, what are we having for dinner? Some of you trying to figure out do we have to eat again? And yet we do. We just continue. Eat and education. So while we couldn't do the eating part, we did get a bit of the education in. So finally, the very last word of tonight's Liars Club, the Armchair Expedition Special. Are you ready for this one? The final word is polyphony don't. See how I fluff the middle of that? Polyphiodont. Polyphiodont. I definitely have that spelled wrong. Polyphiodont. This is the last word, folks. Listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. Jack, are you there? Calling Jack. Can you oh, give I... us your final definition for polyphiodont? Yeah. And for the final definition, I'm going to wear my Zagram hat. Hey! And... Um, uh, you do have your pronunciation a little bit off, but I, I realize that you uh, have that funny Irish accent, but it's polyphiodont. Right. Polyphiodont. And our audience, I'm sure, will pick up on the odont part, obviously means teeth. And polyphiodont refers to uh, uh, organisms that have more than one set of teeth. and in ichthyology, there are fish that have several sets of teeth, and some of the teeth are tricuspid or bicuspid. And so the study of the dentition of fishes uh, and the evolution that's associated to it, it also is uh, researched in birds. Uh, Polyphiodont refers to um, uh, multiple teeth in life forms. Fascinating, Jack. Thank you very, very much indeed for imparting that on us tonight. Uh, Madalena, can we have your definition, please? Madalena. Yes, so Jack is almost right, but not quite right. Uh, it has to do with teeth, but it's a different story. Remember when they told us that uh, after our teeth fell, when we were childs, that they regrow? And people kind of call them definitive ones. Well, I guess by now we have all figured out that's not quite true, is it? So how cool it, would it be to have the ability of regrowing teeth all your life, constantly regrowing? So keep growing and growing and growing all your life. It's not the same as like horses because they keep growing the same one, but new ones, getting new, fresh, white ones. Uh, so genetic studies have experiments and done some research in rats with stem cells. And in certain conditions, they have been able to regenerate structures, normal structures like teeth. But then it's when you called polyphiodont. But the problem is that these things can go wrong and if they go wrong, you might find yourself getting some teeth in unusual spots of your body. So maybe with new technology, we can get this better and hope for a new set of teeth. Uh, maybe 5G will help us, but who knows? So it's growing teeth all your life, new ones, freshly brand white ones. Thank you very much, Mara. Thank you very much indeed. That was excellent. And Tom? Tom calling, Tom, ground control to... Receiving you loud and clear, Jim, go ahead. Go, Roger, over and out. <laughs> I like this one. I think we're ending on a strong one. 
everybody can clearly see those last four letters, don't. If we look at the etymology of the word don't, we're clearly seeing teeth. And my, my previous two colleagues are on to a roll there. Be interesting to see what Shirley Campbell says. Um, Polyphyodont or Polyphyodontosaur was a, a dinosaur, herbivorous dinosaur. And I'm surprised Jack doesn't know this because with his love of fish changing sex, this is, um, it's really interesting actually, and um, was fun doing the research for the truth of this word. The polyphyodonts are the only uh, species of dinosaur we have come across who change sex as they age, just mm. like ras, parrotfish, anemone fish do, things like that. The polyphyodonts all start as female and then a dominant male emerges. And then when that dominant male, uh, um, I'm looking for the word dies, dies when he's died um, and you, <laughs> it's very early, Jim, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, <laughs> dies is a hard word to remember. It um, is. Where was I? Yes, all start as female, the polyphyodontosaurs, and when the, um, the, the male passes away, a new female emerges. So polyphyodont, um, we're looking at uh, the dinosaurs. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and very finally, for our very last definition of the night, I think it's only fitting that it goes to the social anthropologist who's probably been trying to figure out us all and what we're up to tonight with all our comings and goings. Anyway, Shirley, uh, we don't want to know what you think of us. Just give us the definition of polyphyodont. Well, yeah, yeah, the, yeah whatever. <laughs> <laughs> polyphyodont. And, of, and of course, all of my friends have correctly um, identified don't as being something to do with teeth. But they forgot about the poly and the phi. The polyphio means multiple, of course, and the phio means escape, phyodont, polyphyodont. So polyphyodont is an animal which is by design able to escape being killed by predation. So you might, or many of you will probably know about snails that are able to close themselves up when they get eaten by a predator. They close themselves up and just wait their time until they get ejected out the other end of the animal who took them. That is a polyphyodont. Now there is another one that just recently was written up in the esteemed um, uh, journal called Current Biology, the 3rd of August. So I mean, I'm really recently, and it was written up by a Japanese um, ecologist, e ecological bio uh, biologist from Kobe University in Japan. And he's been studying beetles, water beetles in Japan. And this particular one called, um, what's the, Regim, Regimbartia attenuata, he noticed also was able to escape. Now, if this one gets eaten by frogs, so frogs don't have teeth, but this one was able to escape past the, past the crunch of the frog's jaws into the intestinal cavity was not eaten up and digested by the by the digestive juices and slipped out the back end crawling out the back end as happy as larry and as if nothing had ever happened that is a polyphyodont very rare animals but they do exist wow well i think folks you'll have to agree we kept the best to last there that's for sure our team really surpassed themselves even tonight uh, with those Great definitions and a brilliant final round. And so, to recap, for the final word of the Liars Club tonight, for the word polyphodont, uh, <laughs> Jack thinks it's a term applied to the evolution of dentition in fish, birds, and mammals. Thank you, Jack. Mada thinks it's any animal whose teeth are continually replaced. That's what Mada thinks. Tom. How could we not believe Tom? Uh, he thinks it was a large herbivorous dinosaur that actually changed sex with age uh, as necessity required. And finally, star performance from Shirley too. Uh, animals who can survive being eaten and digested by a predator. So, polyphyodont. Can you get voting, please, folks, for the final word in our Liars Club night? And Jack is out in front with 50%. Madeleine is on 24 in second. Tom's on 17 on third. Shirley's on 10%. Jack, they're believing you for the last round. 
Of have course. Money. Have you promised them money for this? You know, here we go. He's on 51% and we've got 82% Pick of the me. load in. Pick me. Uh, come on. Come on. Uh, look at poor, poor, poor Tom's going to need all the support he can get now that he's entering, you know, a settled phase in his life, you know, and all that. He might even have to shave now and again and comb his hair, but that'll be okay. Shirley, Shirley, you're on 13%, girl. You, you know, they just don't believe you. You know, those these honest Southern Hemisphere faces, they, they just don't believe them. Jack, you're on 48%, man. You've really caught up since the start when you used to be way behind. Now you're way out in front. Must be the hat. Must be the hat. The final countdown, the final countdown. Da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. 10, 9, 8, 7. Six, five, four, three, two, one, polling. Finished. That wasn't me. The final one. And Jack, 48% uh. of those sucker, I mean, those people out there believed you uh, as being telling the truth. Madeleine at 23, Shirley and Tom on 15 each. I know it was a great way to finish our, our, uh, our round, our final round. So, it leaves me to ask our esteemed panel of liars and untruth tellers for one of you who has been actually telling the truth on this round, could you please make yourself known to the assembled masses in Zagram Zoomland and me? Who was telling the truth for Polly Fuha Adan? Who we got? It's me! <laughs> Whoa! Wow! In paradise. <laughs> you fooled him. You fooled him, Mada. You f and so did you, Jack. You were so convincing. That was fantastic. That was really, really good. Well, folks, it's been a great night. Uh, I will hand back to Sonia before she finishes so that she can actually clear up the mess I'm probably after making with all the things I've promised or said or shouldn't have said. Um, so it's been fantastic. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Even though it was a virtual one and we weren't all in the same room, I think mentally we were all together. And I think that came across very much so from the vibe from the team. Uh, please, Shirley, take a bow. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Jack, you can uh, doff your hat. Good on you, man. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Madalena, the limbo dancer. Limbo. <laughs> Smiling as ever. Thank you very much indeed. And finally, Tom, the soon to be married man from Australia, no longer on the market, ladies, on any of the expeditions. Okay, off the market. No, he's not on the menu anymore. Tom, take a bow. He hasn't been. There we go. So listen, I hope you enjoyed it as, as much as we did. It's been great fun. I hope the technology held up for everybody as well. And as I say, we'll be back in the not too distant future with another live event to keep you all in touch with us uh, in our virtual world uh, at the moment. Uh, without further ado, uh, could I hand back to Sonia if she's still in the building? Still here and unmuted. Yes? Yes. <laughs> all right, well, that was super fun. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, it was actually a lot harder than I thought it would be. So um, we are gonna have a recorded version of this uh, available on our website by next week. So if you want to entertain your friends, you can play it again and uh, quiz them on their obscure vocabulary knowledge. So um, thank everyone for joining us today. It was really cool to do an interactive event this time. Uh, polling seems to have gone well. A lot of you were able to vote for your favorites and thank you for not using Google. We can tell that everybody was staying honest since uh, we didn't have 100% for every single <laughs> truth teller. Um, we're actually going to be taking a break from live events for a couple of weeks due to some vacation time that is coming up, which, you know, it's August, 
it's beautiful out. So we are still going to have a bunch of fun videos, blogs, and all kinds of things uh, up on the website for you to take a look at and watch and uh, keep up to speed with all of the field staff and what they're up to. I believe there's some hikes that Brad Clemson's been taking in Australia. Rich, of course, is still exploring the North Woods in Minnesota. So uh, definitely keep an eye on your inbox for all of their uh, activities that they'll be doing. And I think this was a really smashing success. So I hope you all enjoyed your time.